Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming out on this uh, uh, rather unpleasant uh, uh, day. But we have a very uh, pleasant reason for uh, gathering. Two reasons. One is, of course, to hear one of our nation's most eminent and accomplished uh, legal scholars. And the other is to uh, celebrate the wonderful life of the late uh, Walter Murphy. Um, there are some disadvantages, I have to say, to being Walter's successor as McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence. Your destiny is to be like the guy, whoever he was, who, who followed Willie Mays as the center fielder for the Giants, or Roberto Clemente as the right fielder for the, uh, for the Pirates. You know, the, the people will always wonder, yeah, who was that guy? Because the real McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is and will always be not Woodrow Wilson or even Edward S. Corwin, uh, but Walter uh, F. Murphy. Now, the compensating advantages, though, are uh, also uh, many. And one of them is the pleasure every year of introducing the Murphy Lecturer and saying a few words about uh, Walter. When the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions was established uh, on July 4th of the year 2000, uh, in the announcement of the creation of the program, uh, was word of the first activity, and that was the Murphy Lecture. The Murphy Lecture is as old as the Madison program, 18 years old uh, to be exact, uh, and it is our way of honoring a, a very great man, a great scholar, uh, a great teacher, uh, a great writer of fiction, a great patriot who served his nation with enormous distinction and valor uh, in Korea, a Marine who attained uh, the rank of Colonel, uh, winner of the Purple Heart and also of the uh, Distinguished Service uh, Cross, uh, someone whose experience of uh, war and the horrors of war led him uh, in the end to or very near to uh, pacifism. Uh, Walter was really a remarkable person. He was interested in ideas. He was interested uh, in philosophy and history and sociology as well as political science and constitutional uh, law. And he encouraged uh, his students and those of us who were not formally his students in the sense of having sat in a classroom with him, but those of us who were nevertheless his students because we learned so much from him. He encouraged uh, all of us uh, to think deeply and to think critically and to think for ourselves. Uh, far be it from Walter to demand uh, that people share his views or approaches uh, he was exemplary in his willingness to encourage uh, other people uh, to uh, follow their uh, ideas and follow their own uh, logic and spirit uh, to whatever conclusions uh, they ended up taking. Uh, I was a beneficiary of that, as were generations of his students. In the obituary published uh, upon Walter's death in the New York Times, uh, it said that he was a revered figure on the Princeton campus. Um, now, I'm a person who frequently finds himself quarreling with claims made in the New York Times, but I certainly wouldn't quarrel uh, with that uh, claim. He was indeed a revered figure, and uh, not only by his students, also by his colleagues and by administrators in the university and by people in the Princeton uh, community. Of course, his novel, uh, The Vicar of Trice, Christ, sort of came true uh, in the pontificate of of Pope uh, Francis, and I only uh, regret that Walter didn't live to see it, although, you know, who knows? Uh, maybe Walter knows all about that. Maybe he arranged it. Uh, who knows? Uh, but uh, those of you who know the novel, know about a Pope Francis uh, uh, in advance, uh, doesn't quite fit in every detail the description of um, the, the actual Pope Francis. Uh, the Pope in the Vicar of Christ uh, is an ex-Marine uh, who served in Korea. Uh, and who became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States before going uh, into a monastery and eventually being elected Pope. It is still the darndest good read uh, that you can, uh, then you can have, and if you haven't read The Vicar of Christ, you want to read that. Uh, in the scholarly uh, domain, uh, I believe his book, Elements of Judicial Strategy, is uh, still a uh, peerless uh, work of scholarship in the field of judicial behavior, in which Walter was a major figure before moving on um, into the area of constitutional studies, where he also made uh, very important uh, contributions. Well, uh, how do you honor a very great scholar? Well, in the Madison program, we decided that the best way to honor a very great scholar is with a lecture by a very great scholar. And we have a very great scholar to be our Murphy lecturer uh, this year.
Uh, Richard Epstein uh, was born in New York and grew up on Long Island. He is the Lawrence Tisch Professor of Law at New York University and the Peter and Kirsten Bedford Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. Uh, he is the James Parker Hall Distinguished Service Professor of Law Emeritus and uh, Senior Lecturer at the University of Chicago Law School where he taught for many years before moving uh, to NYU. The range of uh, subjects on which he has written with enormous uh, illumination uh, is vast. In this uh, respect, our lecturer uh, very much uh, resembles uh, the man who is honored uh, by this lecture, Walter uh, Murphy. Um, he wrote the book Forbidden Grounds, uh, subtitled The Case Against Employment Discrimination Laws. He wrote Simple Rules of a Complex World and the classical liberal constitution, subtitled The Uncertain Quest for Limited Government. Uh, he has been elected to membership all the way back in 1985 in the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and in 2011 he won the Bradley Prize for Civic and Intellectual uh, Achievement. He is a graduate of Columbia University, uh, holds a, uh, a degree from Oxford uh, University where he studied uh, law and legal history, and uh, earned his LLB back when they granted LLBs, the true law degree, uh, now dressed up as the JD. Uh, I'd love to have an LLB, Richie, if you, if you have one to spare, um, from Yale Law School. And uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome, as the, 19, as the uh, 2018 Murphy Lecturer, uh, Professor Richard Epstein. Thank you. because if I did, I couldn't survive the light. I should say that um, I just had a wonderful time talking to the students in the Madison program for about an hour and a half, and it may have taken my voice away. And before that, Evie and I had a nice tired lunch, and before that, I had an engaged conversation with Robbie, the driver, who picked me here from New York. So you are basically the fourth talk that I'm giving today. <laughs> and I'm not so sure that I could save the best for last, but I will do the best that I can. Let me just take out this program and remember what my topic is. Uh, this is all for affectation. You know, the unfulfilled promise of the anti-discrimination law. One of the things I like to do when I give a talk is to criticize the title uh, that I've given to the talk that I'm about to give on the theory that one has to be the harshest critic of his own work. And uh, what is wrong with that title is, is almost too difficult to say, but let me start to point about it. One is, I think, that it simply tries to cover too much. Uh, the category of anti-discrimination laws, which essentially related to common carrier service when I was in law school in 1964 to 68, even though we had something known as the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which had just gone on to the books, is much smaller than, than it is now. Uh, today, it turns out that we keep adding categories to the anti-scope discrimination laws and keep making more stringent the various rules for penalizing that we used to penalize for people who don't follow the norms. And so you could give this entire lecture on sex, you could give it on age, you could give it on uh, disability and so forth, national origin, religion. But I think if you're trying to understand the way in which this subject is put together, <coughs> probably your best to give your main focus with respect to issues of race, and that's what I'm going to do here. If I deviate and lapse from that occasionally, I'm not going to apologize for it. It seems to me that sometimes the contrast across different areas of discrimination law is extremely important. And the second thing I don't like about my chosen title is that I think it sort of misstates the way in which one ought to understand the anti-discrimination law. I do talk about its unfulfilled promise, and I do think that there's a great deal of accuracy with respect to that particular title. But I think it would be wrong to assume that every single thing that was done was an unfulfilled expectation of disappointment. The way in which I like to think about the rules associated with the anti-discrimination laws is to put them in two acts. And the first act roughly runs uh, through the passage and adoption of the law in 1964 and probably comes to an end, I think, by 1970 or 1971. Uh, when we get the first of the major cases dealing with its interpretation, in this particular instance, Griggs against Duke Power, after which it turns out that the laws take a very different tone that they have earlier on in the cycle. And so what I want to do is sort of explain to you 
Uh, the way in which the landscape lined up when these laws were first adopted in 1964. And I do so not only as a matter of history, uh, but I was actually in college at that particular time and we had intense debates about the ways in which these laws ought to be understood and how in which things ought to have been done. And in doing this, even in college, I was something of an incipient libertarian classical liberal. And so essentially what I did was have a very strong bias against any form of government intervention, including government intervention with respect to the employment relationship. And so therefore, as a sort of a matter of abstract theory, if you believe that these labor markets are quote unquote competitive and somebody wants to come along and to give it regulation, in the end you believe that the only question you're worried about is how much of a mistake it will take. And that's perfectly fine if what you're doing is blackboard economics and what you're doing is trying to talk about a particular doctrine independent of the historical context in which it arises. Uh, but the history of American relationships with respect to race starting in the Civil War and working up to 1964 is a period of great disappointment. And it turns out dreadful behavior on the part of many American institutions which make this ideal model of a competitive market uh, something of a will of the wisp, at least until you have other major structural reforms. So for those of you who are not familiar with the history, uh, the great expectations of the Republicans in Congress in the 1860s was the adoption of the 14th Amendment, uh, which contains in its first section four key provisions. One is the definition, it's not the definition, but a test for citizenship which overrules Dred Scott. Uh, by saying any person born and naturalized in the United States is a citizen of the United States and of the state in which he resides. Uh, then there are privileges and immunities given only to citizens. Uh, then there are guarantees given to all persons under the Equal Protection Clause and under the Due Process Clause. And the question is, how do you understand uh, these kinds of relationships? For somebody who's relatively naive about this particular situation, what you would do is to try to understand the basic contractual text, constitutional text, in line of the basic principles of national and international law, uh, which start to tell you something about citizenship and something about other persons, namely aliens. And what you would do is you would come up with a two-part structure, uh, which still remains valid today. If you are a citizen, you get a series of rights that are not given to aliens. But if you are an alien, you get a series of basic rights which are also given to citizens. And if you're trying to cash that out in a concrete fashion, uh, what happens is that the basic rights turn out to be fundamentally two. Uh, one is there's going to be no arbitrary seizure of property, uh, so that confiscation is not part of the game. And there's going to be no artificial incarceration for people without cause. Uh, you're going to have to have due process. Equal protection means, essentially in its original convection, when you do apply the criminal law, you can't go light on some person because he's white or black and heavy on somebody else because of the opposite race. It's a kind of a neutral standard, one to which I think we still adhere in the criminal law to this day. If you're a citizen, you get a couple of other things. One is you get protections for occupational freedom, meaning that you can enter into certain kinds of occupations without getting licenses and approvals and so forth. And also you get the right to keep and own property. Now, all of this stuff was made pretty clear in the uh, uh, Civil Rights Act of 1866, which sort of basically protected these kinds of rights to contract, make wills and give evidence and so forth, all of which fall very nicely into the libertarian model of people with full capacity and the title to do more or less what they want. What happens is the structure as we put together was to be enforced by Congress through appropriate legislation. They did not trust the courts after uh, Dred Scott, and it turned out that the entire scene was basically scuttled uh, within the next 30 years, which explains why it is that the problem that faced the United States in 1964 was one of such dramatic consequence. I'm not going to go through all of the decisions here, but I think it's important uh, to mention at least three of the earlier cases. The first of these cases is the Slaughterhouse case, which involved the situation in which it turned out that the state of Louisiana created a slaughterhouse monopoly outside the city and it gave an exclusive franchise in that to a given person and this was challenged essentially 
as invading the privileges and immunities of ordinary citizens. And the case basically fits like a glove uh, to the situation I give in hand. Uh, being a butcher is an ordinary occupation, and it turns out that excluding somebody from it entirely is going to be wholly inappropriate, so you've got yourself a prima facie case. That doesn't mean you can do whatever you want, because by the time we get to the 1870s, there's something known as the police power. And what the police power does, it allows you to regulate certain activities to protect, amongst other things, the health and safety of various kinds of individuals. And butchery is a very messy business, and they can certainly regulate it so you don't contaminate streams, or create air pollution, and so forth, all of which was well recognized by the Supreme Court during this period, most notably in a case called Hyde Park Fertilizer in the 1880s, or 70s rather, in which the Supreme Court said, of course you can shut down somebody who's stinking up the entire universe. Uh, but what went on in this particular case is they did not do this nuanced inquiry, because there's no police power justification for just wiping somebody out. Instead, what they said is that the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States only included those rights which you had by virtue of being a United States citizen, and so ended up covering two things. Uh, one of those things was the right to petition the federal government under the First Amendment, and the other was to use interstate navigable rivers. As Justice Field said in his rather impassioned dissent, uh, why would you have the huge fuss if that's all that you achieve, since those rights would probably be there anyhow, wholly without the 14th Amendment. The net effect was that it made huge amounts of the protection that the Constitution was supposed to provide into some kind of a dead level. And those of us who are libertarian will know full well that to the extent that the government can take away from people the kinds of occupational freedoms and liberty choices that are otherwise there, uh, the uh, 14th Amendment, as read in the Slaughterhouse case, turns out to be a profoundly, profoundly anti-libertarian doctrine. Things only get worse. A couple of years later, there's a case called Crookshank, which comes down. And there had been a Colfax massacre in the state of Louisiana. And it turned out you had to bring people, uh, essentially, to justice. And the question was whether or not an independent federal government could act to override this particular situation, or whether or not the people who killed and murdered in order to gain control of the state legislature can then be tried before judges of their own friends, so that the people who did all the killing would be the people who do all the judging of the people who did all the killing. And the Supreme Court applied the slaughterhouse case, and what it said under these particular uh, circumstances is that the right to keep and bear arms is not one of the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, so the federal government has to stay out. This was the year before Reconstruction ended, so by the time you're done, it turns out that the first two cases strip people of ordinary civil rights and of ordinary criminal protection. And so when Reconstruction ended a year later in 1877, all the cars in the deck were arraigned to make sure that segregation had become a powerful possibility. Things only got worse with the third of these particular cases, uh, which was Plessy and Ferguson decided in 1896. And this was a case which essentially decided three kinds of issues. One, it decided most concretely as to whether or not you can have segregation on streetcars and trains. The second was whether or not you can have segregated schools. And the third was whether or not you can impose anti-miscegenation laws on various parties. Now, if you took the common law rules on these particular situations, two of the three cases are quite easy, and the third case is actually a little bit tricky. Now, the first of them about segregation runs into the teeth of a very long constitution, rather a common law rule, uh, which essentially says that when you're a common carrier providing a standardized services, uh, you have to have fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory treatment uh, so that the only way you can engage in various forms of segregation is to show that there was some danger from mixing people together, which might trigger a police power issue. And again, it would be hopelessly naive to say sitting next to somebody on a train is in fact the source of this kind of trouble, and so you can't do it. Uh, the second of the situations on anti-miscegenation laws is amongst the civil rights of contract is the right to marry the person whom you choose to marry, uh, certainly at least in those days the person of the opposite sex that had been recognized everywhere and at every time, and now that is called into question. The hard case, which is one that recognizes a deep structural weakness in the American Constitution, 
as of that time was the question of whether or not you could maintain segregated schools. Why is that so difficult? Because of a single proposition at an abstract level which seems quite innocuous, but at a concrete level turns out to be exceedingly important. Uh, namely the question as to whether or not the Equal Protection Clause, the Due Process Clause, the Privileges or Immunity Clause applies to the extent that the government is giving out various kinds of benefits as opposed to imposing various kinds of sanctions on people for the kinds of things that they should not do. And we still do not have a strong theory of unconstitutional conditions accepted by the court, which tells you what limitations, if any, can be imposed on the way in which these benefits are provided. Uh, so at the time, it was probably a more accurate rendition than not that some degree of separation might be consistent with the Equal Protection Clause, but the results become so difficult that in the end you have to back off of that and say, to some extent at least, privileges and immunities, equal protection and due process also provide for the, I'll cover the situation of distribution of benefits, and we only get to that position in a very weak Supreme Court opinion of momentous importance which is Brown v. Board of Education, which, because it did not articulate the strongest reasons for what it did, left itself open to very powerful southern counterattacks in the 1970s. Uh, this situation was, in fact, uh, extremely clear, uh, so that by the time you're done with Plessy v. Ferguson, what you note is that the police power is no longer concerned solely with health and safety. It now has many more diffuse objectives, including maintaining some form of racial balance. And one of the things that libertarians like myself have always said is you must have the police power to control the nuisance, but you don't want to have a police power that can be abused to uh, limit various forms of freedom of association. But the president was so entrenched uh, that when the NAACP was formed in around 1908, and when Woodrow Wilson, uh, somebody known to these quarters, resegregated the civil service in the United States when he became president in 1913 or so, Nobody thought, given Plessy v. Ferguson, that there was a constitutional way in which you can challenge a decision which, for the purposes of American constitutional law at that time, was simply and solely to be regarded as an administrative matter outside the scope of judicial review. So once you have this particular situation at hand, entrenched segregation, voting restrictions, and so forth, the thought that somehow or other uh, you can get yourself a competitive market of the sort in which the discrimination laws really ought not to play a part is something of a pipe dream. What you do is you have a deeply set of biased, monopolistic structures put into place by governments, supported by every conceivable device imaginable. In fact, at this particular point, I always like to refer uh, to a very important book by C. Van Woodward called The Strange Career of Jim Crow. Why do I want to refer to that? Uh, because uh, Woodward was a great historian, and he said, I do not understand how it was that they could maintain segregation with such a ferocious level when, in fact, there are no formally segregated rules on the books anywhere with exception of one small case in South Carolina. Well, he never met my Uncle Albert. And now, why do I mention Uncle Albert? Because I remember in 1956 when he, or actually early 1950, when he relocated his business from New York to York, Pennsylvania, and I said, why didn't you go down to the South where it's cheap labor? He says, I'm no virtuous man, uh, but I cannot imagine how I'm going to do business where I know the moment I start to hire black workers on a parity with white workers, they will cut off my electric power, they'll cut off my gas meter, uh, they'll do all sorts of things through their common carry facilities in order to ruin my business. And in fact, it was precisely because you had monopoly control over these infrastructure devices that you could run a segregation system under the radar by making these ad hoc cases. And the threat was so powerful that everybody wanted to disappear. So when you start thinking about the civil rights movement um, going up through the Civil Rights Act of 1964, what you're really trying to do is to basically disaggregate and to disassemble this huge system of state-controlled monopoly power, which essentially is utterly antithetical to the way in which particular markets work. Now, how does this particular thing happen? Well, there is a heroic period, I think, in the American civil rights movement, which certainly lasts through, I would say, 1964. And the question is, exactly how is this done? Well, the first thing to understand is it was done slowly and painfully, but institutions like the University of Chicago Laboratory, 
uh, schools were segregated by race as late as the 1940s. Uh, the University of the State of New Jersey, known to some of you here, ran segregated schools until 1947. Major League Baseball only integrated with Jackie Robinson in the same year. And it turns out that the military was desegregated by executive order in July of 1948 uh, by Harry Truman. Um, one of my late colleagues, Stan, you will remember him, Walter Blum, uh, worked at Fort Benning in 1941. And I asked him at the ripe old age, 23, suppose you had tried to integrate the military service on the eve of World War I, what would have happened? He said you would have had a race riot, the likes of which you had never seen before. And so it was quite clear that the transformation of the war, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen and a variety of other things, the Japanese experience, uh, the Gobitis case and the Barnett case, led to a major transformation. That's the flag salute cases for those who don't know it. So by 1948, which was unthinkable seven years before, uh, now became something which could be done without a murmur of systematic protest. And so what we did is we started to see in this period, uh, before 1964, a genuine movements in the right direction, slowly, brick by brick, disassembling everything. Uh, the major move was, of course, Brown v. Board of Education, where we were told without explanation that segregation has, quote, no place in the American system. I've come to admire Earl Warren more and more because I think that simple, direct statement is more powerful and more influential than some elaborate justification that lacks any kind of moral fervor and is going to always be subject to powerful attack on narrow legalistic grounds. We do have a major confrontation at Little Rock in a case called Cooper and Aaron of 1957 in which Eisenhower, desperate for protection, is more than happy to yield to judicial supremacy in the complete reversal of Dred Scott, where Lincoln made his career, both before and during the Civil War, in fighting the notion of judicial supremacy in order to get rid of one case and one case only, which was Dred Scott and all the terrible things that it stood for. And so by the time we get to the Civil Rights Amendments of 19, or Civil Rights Laws of 1964 on the matters of race, it turns out that what we do is we have a pretty good picture of what we want to do. And then history intervenes in a way uh, which I think has immense con uh, consequences, which is not fully appreciated. There was a very powerful bipartisan, uh, shall we say, coalition behind the civil rights law. Uh, there was, of course, Everett Dirksen making his famous move at the end to carry it over the top. Uh, there was the Clark case memo written earlier on by Joseph Clark of, Penn of Pennsylvania and Clifford Case of New Jersey, explaining how mild, moderate, and limited the civil rights laws were, and so that everybody should be perfectly prepared to adopt them, because it's not going to throw a huge monkey wrench into the way in which ordinary businesses run their private affairs. I think it is fair to say that during the course of the negotiations that took place in the public debate, essentially the defenders of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 beat a hasty retreat on a wide variety of issues having to do with, for example, disparate impact, testing, and so forth, in an effort to get this well through. What kinds of people were they? They were all basically New Dealers, uh, Democrats and Republicans. The Democratic side is perfectly obvious to anybody who looks at the particular problem. Um, they are the direct descendants of the New Deal. Uh, but Eisenhower Republicans, which were still around in large numbers, essentially thought that the appropriate way in which to run the United States was to validate the New Deal institutions that we had and to make them work in a relatively sensible and moderate fashion. Within the legal academy, there was something known as the legal process movement, essentially identified with Hart and Sachs at Harvard in the 1950s and so forth, which was designed to tell you how lawyers intelligently, incrementally implement all of the New Deal's reforms. And when it comes to a man like Hubert Humphrey, who was something of a hero in this, um, I'm, Stan would remember it, I certainly remember it vaguely, um, uh, Hubert Humphrey in Philadelphia facing down uh, the segregationists at the 1948 uh, Democratic National Convention was a sheer act of political courage. So how does this thing take place? Humphrey said it very clearly. He said, look, you know, we're perfectly happy with wages and hours regulations, we're happy with minimum wages, we're happy with the National Labor Relations Act. This is just another one of these constructive interventions that we're having along the lines of everything else. Even in college in 1964, 
I didn't like the National Relations Act. I didn't like the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, but I understood that the race question was very different. What's the difference between them? You were trying through the Civil Rights Act to undo a series of restrictions on market freedom. And in the other cases, you were imposing restrictions on market freedom, the cost of which I think had become abundantly clear in the years afterwards. But I'll wait for the questions to talk about uh, fair labor standards, unions, or anything else of the sort. Uh, the key point to understand is once you did this, then you have the following kinds of things to understand, and it's a decidedly mixed bag. On the one hand, Title I is designed to take after uh, various problems associated with disenfranchised voting, and any sensible person would clearly understand that systematic exclusion from the polls is a disaster. And the next year with the Voting Rights Act, essentially they realize that districting and other issues might also influence the outcome. That turns out to be a much more difficult task to implement. We're not going to go into its details now than simply getting rid of artificial restrictions against getting people to the polls at all. And the 1964 Act, to the extent that you have enormously high rates of turnout across the entire population, has to be regarded as a triumph in terms of the things that it managed to undo. You still then have all the stuff with respect to common carrier regulation. And to the extent that what you're trying to do is to make sure that people can sit down next to one another in restaurants and so forth. Uh, again, this is not something that is going to be a source of enormous difficulty. They define, in my view, common carriers too broadly in this case. But the key issue, as everybody understood at the time, is that no national franchise wanted to try and project an image of being segregated in the South or being open in the North. So there was huge business support for Title II. Title VII, which is the one I'm going to focus on, is a very different kettle of fish in terms of the way in which it was articulated and implemented. And it's here where we see both the promise and the disappointment associated with uh, the Civil Rights Movement of 1964. So if you start to look at this, uh, what you realize is the way in which uh, Title VII begins is uh, with an injunction which says it shall be unlawful for any employer, and then it says to refail or refuse to hire, to discharge or to otherwise discriminate, note that fast, against any individual uh, because of race religion, sex, speech, and so forth. And this is a prohibition which was designed to institute a colorblind kind of an arrangement. Now, why is it that this colorblind arrangement has such an incredible appeal in 1964 and to many people still has it today? It's because everybody remembers the stirring and prescient dissent of Justice John Marshall Harlan in 1896 in Plessy Brown and Ferguson, where in the face of the three restrictions that I just mentioned, he says we are bound and committed uh, to living ourselves in a colorblind world. And that became essentially uh, the model. Now, what is right and what is wrong about this situation is very instructive. There is no question that I think that the Harlan edifice is correct if you're talking about the direct application and enforcement of the criminal law. We could not imagine a system in which a white person gets double the punishment for burglary or murder than a black person, or doing it the other way around. To this day, our notions of affirmative action have never made their way into the enforcement of the criminal law. All of the anxieties and concerns over everything from arrest rates and stop and frisk and so forth are about differential applications of addicting laws in which you're trying to make sure that the administration is colorblind rather than otherwise again, a much more difficult task to do than you might otherwise have supposed when you started the particular inquiry. But labor markets are very different. Uh, there is no reason why you have to have a uniform national policy. In principle, you can follow the Hayekian notion that decentralized decision-making will outperform centralized decision-making because each particular institution has a localized knowledge of its own needs and preferences and can decide whether or not, and if so, how, uh, to interview or to entertain a program associated with affirmative action or anti-affirmative action or anything of the sort. And the colorblind program was put forward uh, because it was thought that the dominant tendency at the time would be that institutions, even if freed from state coercion, would choose to reinstate the particular practices associated with segregation. And so the question was, put these restrictions in place so we will not get any backslide. 
Uh, but it turns out the past is often a very bad prologue for the future. And at the same time that the law goes on the books, all the riots now start to begin. I was in New York City when this happened. It happened in Newark. It happened in Chicago. It happened in Los Angeles. It happened in Miami. It happened in Washington, D.C. Um, this was before Vietnam became big or while it was big, but we certainly had a domestic war zone like we did a foreign war zone. Uh, but what happened is the price for getting uh, the backsliding out of the system was to agree that there would be no affirmative action of any sort, kind, of description. Uh, that was essentially made clear if you just looked at the basic provision of Section 703, which talks about any individual and any employer in this sort of abstract Kantian type way. And if you're just too thick to understand that, uh, there is Section 703J, which talks about the fact that there's no preferential treatment based upon disparate numbers or disparate percentages in various kinds of operations. So essentially, they had put together a two-tailed system, and this turned out to be a colossal miscalculation. Why is that? Because by the time you get to 1964 and the end of 1965, everybody understands that the rationales that have been used for the colorblind uh, justifications of 1964 were obsolete in 1965. If you're facing a major racial crisis of immediate proportions, all sorts of legitimate pent-up resentment, and the only thing you can do to say to people is, well, when the education system gets a little bit better and your little children go up and enter into the workforce, we may be able to iron this problem out in 1980 or 1982. Uh, you have to remember the schools themselves were in pretty decrepit situations. Uh, the ability to move a system like that from the federal government, given local control, is non-existent. This is essentially a giant pipe dream. And so every responsible civic leader, even in the union movement and the management union, says, look, if this is going to be a national problem, we have to kick in and do our bits. And I can still remember when I started teaching at the University of Southern California in 1968, and everybody started looking at the statute, there was always the argument that, look, Title VII is a flat prohibition. You're asking us to do something illegal. And in addition to that, there were many New Deal types that said, not only is it a prohibition, but it's a correct prohibition, because what they did is falsely analogize the employment situation with the criminal law situation. So the thing essentially stays in uneasy stasis with respect to unions and with respect to employers until we get Justice Brennan doing one of his typical tour de forces in 1979 in the case of Weber, where he essentially doesn't bother to read the whole statute. That's much too cumbersome. He just cuts out the last bit of it, which says against person of any race, creed, color, or religion, and substitutes inconsistent with the purposes of this particular act. Now, what does he mean by that? He said by 1978, we understand now just how grave the problem was. If I'm going to stick with this colorblind straitjacket, I'm going to put myself into an impossible kind of position. Uh, Justice Brennan was never above, he was from New Jersey, by the way, um, never above, um, shall we say, torturing statutory language in order to get a decent social result. And in fact, I give him a mixed verdict. Terrible on the statute, but essentially if he had decided this thing the other way and we had a rigid colorblind rule that continued forward in the future, it would have been a total disaster. Uh, the way to understand Weber is not to understand that it's an affirmation of civil rights, Understand it as a partial repeal of the 1964 Act, which gives business judgment and military judgment and lots of other people a degree of freedom that they did not have beforehand. And that turned out to be enormously important in trying to figure out how you do this thing right. Uh, it's not, however, as simple as all that. Uh, there are a couple of complications. One is, if you're doing this by misreading a particular statute instead of repealing it, are you always going to have the question, well, just how far does Weber go? What can you do? What can you not do? And so there's going to be some residual uh, uncertainty in the case, even if you only look at that provision. But there's a second part of this, which is equally important to understand, which is the movement with respect to disparate impact uh, that reaches its peak seven years earlier, eight years earlier, in a case called Griggs against Duke Power, in which what you do is you have a situation where many firms, including Duke Power Company, which had been relatively segregated, had decided that they have seen the light and they're going to try and figure out how they can ameliorate this problem by opening up ranks and giving people standardized tests. 
And it turns out most of these standardized tests have some degree of disparate impact. And so the question is, how does that apply? If you go back and you read what the statute said, this was exactly one of the things that the Southerners and, in fact, many of the Republicans were able to impress upon the statute itself. We start having the United States government interfering and figuring out what kinds of tests you can use to hire and fire people. It's going to be an enormous takeover over the way in which the particular market ought to be operated. So they put in there a rule which said that essentially you can use any professionally devised test, which the GED and all these other tests were surely ones of them, uh, unless it is intended, designed, or used in order to perpetuate distinction, uh, discrimination on the grounds of race. And if you read those three words in parallel, essentially what it means is used has to follow the other two. So if you have 10 tests out there and you know one of them is systematically going to disfavor black applicants and that's the only test that you decide to use, uh, that would be a matter of using a test for improper circumstances. Uh, but Justice Berger, who did not know much about what was going on here, read the term very differently. What he says, if the test has the effect of giving you differential results, it's used. And so essentially what happened is by treating the word used as an effects test rather than an intense test, it turned out that it wiped out the entire saving clause and it has never been cited or referred to again. This was a complete transformation of the meaning that was associated with the particular operation. And essentially what it did is it meant that now you had to figure out when and how you could use these tests. And there were several themes that were extremely important. Uh, one of them was the question of administrative deference. This becomes a central theme in American administrative law um, 13 years later in a case called Chevron um, against the National Defense Resource um, Council on how much deference you give. Uh, but our friend Berger said, we give a lot of deference to the Civil Rights Office in the way in which it reads these things. My view is you never give any deference to any agency on any question of statutory construction. Uh, they can argue it as best or as worst they can, but you just got to get it right. And then secondly, since he gave them deference, he decided that we now have two tests. Uh, we have to worry about disparate impact, uh, which you could justify only in the case of business necessity. Neither of these things are part of the statute. Uh, so what happens is the Civil Rights Act, which is repealed on one side uh, in 1979 with Weber, is in fact doubly strengthened on the other side uh, with the Griggs case. And so what happens is it completely makes it very, very difficult to understand how you use any form of testing. Uh, to be clear, if you're running the National Football Association, you can run as many tests as you want uh, because to the extent that minority groups are in the majority in that public public in that, in that sector, you don't have disparate impact to trouble you with, and these people use these tests. You could use them in all sorts of schools because they're not employment tests, but with respect to standard jobs, you can't use them unless they're tailored to the position. And the moment you tailor them, the tests become largely worthless. Why is that? Because when you give these tests, you want to test generalized skills to see how people are going to be able to be promoted inside the organization. Those generalized tests are much more likely to have disparate impact than tests which are tailored for a particular position, but the particular position tests are much less valuable to the firm because it tells you what you do tomorrow, but it doesn't give you any idea of how people are going to be able to work later down the line. So you have the tension between these two particular areas, and there's no question that when Congress was faced with a decision in Ward's Cove in 1989 in which Justice Rehnquist hinted that, you know, we're willing to relax this thing a little bit, or the door slams shut. And it turned out that Congress basically reinstated with explicit textual authorization of the disparate impact test. I can tell you by way of personal anecdote that I was invited at the time uh, to testify against the amendment. And I said, look, I'm happy to testify against the amendment on one condition which is you allow me to testify against the application of the Civil Rights Act in private competitive employment markets because I don't think that this system has worked at all. I think, in fact, you would have a more prosperous workforce, a more integrated workforce, if you essentially allowed affirmative action and didn't worry about the testing. So what then became the key decision on the integration of these two particular areas? It's a case that most of you have never heard of. It's a case called Connecticut against Teal. It's a 1982 decision. And it really asks an incredibly simple question. Uh, the state of Connecticut 
was fully committed at this time to having affirmative action programs, as were most Northeast governors. And nobody ever doubted their bona fides with respect to these particular programs. What it did is it gave a series of tests um, which had a disparate impact. And it turned out what they did is they made one substantive judgment, which is what kind of a discount or a setback or an adjustment factor are we prepared to make for this particular text in order to get minority representation up to what we regard as a successful level in these inquiries. And I basically am quite sympathetic with that as a goal. I think any institution has to worry not only about individual merits, but it has to worry about how the various pieces of the puzzle cohere with one another. As a good Hayekian on this point, I think the guys who are running an institution know a lot more about that than anybody on the Supreme Court. Um, that includes John Roberts, and so when they started to strike down these elaborate compromise plans on school busing in the first part of the 21st century, Parents United and so forth, I thought those cases were wrong because I think good faith community adjustments be um, hardline, colorblind rules that are put together by a court which has no direct administrative experience <coughs> with anything involved. I don't know whether this makes me a liberal or conservative, but frankly, I don't care. I think the important thing to understand is when you have fiduciary duties, you also have to get the benefit of the business judgment rule, and if that means that we don't go by strict questions of merit in the way in which we allocate positions, there has to be at least some understanding that this is a valid concern. How valid and where is a very difficult question, because it's not going to be a trump, it's going to be a factor. And so when you got the teal, uh, what Connecticut did was it took the tails and it says, well, we're going to add 12 points uh, to the scores of the minority candidates in order to get the correct rounds. But we're going to keep the rank order in both of these areas, so they respected the test. <coughs> What happens is Winnie Teal doesn't get in on the black side of this thing. She's too low and she says, we just have to throw the whole thing out and do a different matter. Which means in effect that Justice Brennan, when he said that she's right, that Civil Rights Act is not about structure but only about individual cases, clearly wrong if you're thinking about the way the history of the act has worked. He meant that you could not do the following, which is essentially to say that we relax the disparate impact test in any institution that is committed to an affirmative action program. If you did that, essentially you would repeal virtually all the worst features associated uh, with the Civil Rights Act without having to make any major structural commitments of one kind or another, which would have terribly hostile symbolic effects for very large portions of the country, most of which, if you haven't figured this out, tend to disagree with me on a number of substantive issues. But they didn't do that. And the moment you then do this, you change the way in which the world is organized. And how do you change it? What you do is you have to lower the cutoff, and then what you do is you look to soft factors to figure out the way in which people are going to be done there afterwards. And the soft factors essentially involve the very things which the racial reformers of the early part of the 20th century are deeply opposed to, ad hoc judgments which they thought would be used to discriminate against disappointed and or discriminated individuals. How much more time? Five minutes? Um, they just, it just asking for trouble. So that's when they put in the IQ test, the merit test, and so forth. These were all efforts to try and stabilize the situation. Now it turns out uh, the wheels are turned, and you introduce these subjective factors, and it turns out they tend to play too large a role in the way in which things are done. Anybody who's ever done admissions work at Princeton will tell you what I'm going to tell you now. Generally speaking, the people who have really strong grades and board scores are the ones who usually have really strong extracurricular activities, outside interests, and so forth. The idea that there would be a massive reversal that most of these kids who have board scores that are low are really great flautists or poets or something of the else doesn't happen. And so then the question is, how do you integrate it? And this, of course, then leads us to the last thing that I will talk about, which is the very complicated essay or interest involving the lawsuit which is now taking place at Harvard, involving uh, the preferences against Asian American students with respect to getting into the class. And I am a person of very mixed emotions with respect to the way in which this particular case works, and let me explain to you what it was. I essentially have still taken the view that every private institution should be allowed to choose the composition of its faculty and should be allowed to choose the composition of its staff and student without benevolent oversight from me. 
I think I'm entitled to vote in my own institution. I don't think I'm entitled to tell Princeton or have my proxies in Washington tell Princeton or any other university what to do. But of course, the basic premise of the Civil Rights Act and its colorblind application is exactly in the opposite. So when you get to Title VI, I believe it is, what you do is you have a rerun of what you found in Title VII on employment, and it says no institution shall discriminate against any person on the basis of various kinds of activities, and it's the same sort of categorical um, issue that you had before. Question is, what do you do? Well, I think what you do is you repeal the sex, and then Harvard can do pretty much what it does, and every other institution can do it. Uh, I don't think if I went to the Harvard faculty, um, particularly the law school, and said, I think you really can solve your problem by a major structural reform, which is to get rid of all anti-discrimination laws as it applies to institutions operating in competitive markets, then I would get a lot of support. Uh, uh, but that, of course, shows you how hopelessly ad hoc it is. If you read the Harvard briefs, it is unmistakable that there's a kind of cultural superiority there because they make a claim which is valid for them but which they somehow or other don't want to extend to everybody else. They said, do you know how complicated it is to put together a class? Do you know the amount of care and attention that we use in trying to structure this program? What do you know in Washington or anyone else about this thing what they've done? You have to defer to our expertise. Well, I think that also applies to Duquesne Law School or to any other place on the face of the globe where local knowledge essentially goes there. The problem is they have to deal with the statute uh, and the absolute prohibition at which point everything becomes sad and confused. First of all, they play exactly the same game that was played in the Teal case. They lower the basic admissions, then allow for adjustments of uh, subjective factors, and then they engage in a kind of soft bigotry which announces all oh, these Asian students are really bad on personality scores. How do we know that? Well, it's pretty obvious. All the interviewers think they're just fine, but we're sitting back here on the paper record and we know they're wrong. Um, this is not going to play well in any fair-minded court. And then what they do is they figure out what kind of discounts and quotas they want to have, and they proceed to announce that they manage to do two things simultaneously, uh, to be colorblind, because they have to be under statute, and then take uh, Asian origin into account, because they have to do that to run the organization. So they introduce a set of justifications, which is fine as a general matter, but which is unacceptable given the statute. And so we are now faced with exactly the same kind of problem that we had much earlier on. How rigid is this colorblind rule going to be? How much of an exception are we going to create? Are we going to see Justice Brennan rise from the grave uh, when he starts to deal with these things and allow Harvard, but perhaps no other institution, that degree of freedom? Or are we going to see the textualists, the literacists, and the historicists, and all the other people come back and say the opposite sign? So let me try to again just summarize on one very simple kind of notion. I think the central feature that you have to understand is that the world is divided for these purposes into two kinds of institutions. Uh, type 1 institution turns out to be those situations where you have monopolistic forces at play. And the sovereign, since it has the exclusive use of force within the territory, fits in that definition. Common carriers uh, fit into that definition. Public utilities fit into that definition. I'm not trying to read this very narrowly. It probably covers 20% of the economy that should be subject to these kinds of restrictions. But for competitive markets, the best protection for anybody is alternative institutions that can take them in when one institution decides to be very nasty in the way in which they treat people. And the reason you know that there was no such movement in the American South is even when you have systematic exclusion, you still find people not going to motels but having to sleep in cars because nobody will take them in. That means that there had to have been a collective refusal to deal, uh, which means that you have to intervene by the state to counteract it under Title II. Uh, but I don't think that is true of Harvard or any other modern institution. So I think that liberalization will do better. Now, somebody's going to say that, well, this will result in some institutions specializing in various forms of bigotry. Some of them will say they'll dress it up as being uh, evangelical Christianity or something of the sort. And my attitude is, thank God. Now, why do I say that? Because if you get a bunch of troublemakers or a bunch of people who are like-minded who want to go into these kinds of institutions, it makes governance in every other institution easier because you don't have to deal with a wide, disparate sense of opinion as to how these things ought to operate. It is very clear when you're dealing with uh, competitive institutions, 
are that when they're deep, divisive situations in there, you need one of two things. You have to have some people sell their interests and get out so the shareholders are unified, or you have to break the organization up so that like-minded people can be in charge of both organizations. And then the two groups that can't govern with one another may be able to trade commodities back and forth uh, to one another. That is, I think, the general rule, no matter what the source of cleavage turns out to be. Uh, so when I said that I thought that the New Deal made the fatal mistake when it analogized the civil rights laws uh, to the uh, laws associated with minimum wage and the laws associated with labor unions, what they did is they picked an analogy to two statutes, both of which are indefensible, in my view, in competitive markets. And once you understand that, what happens is Harvard gets a split verdict. It wins as a matter of first principle, and it's a dead loser on the statute. If that's the way things are coming out, you know it's a very bad sign, because no matter which way the decision is going to come out, it's sure to be attacked for its legitimacy. And the last thing we need to do when we're trying to figure out how to deal with tempestuous problems of race in the United States is to have these kinds of conflicts uh, that take place over decisions that are driven by the deep internal contradictions associated with the modern world. Thank you. Q&A. Uh, let me first ask if any students, we have a custom rich of uh, having students ask first questions. And I know there's some students here from my constitutional interpretation class. I know we some did equal protection school. and affirmative action just a couple of weeks ago. Does anybody, any of the students want to start us with a question? Some. Any student of any type, by the way. You don't have to be in my, con you can be a high school student. Any, any, any students? Come on. No, the students are too shy, but there's a gentleman here who's itching to go, yeah. I don't know if anyone else here is of the age and ethnicity to have experienced Jewish quotas. Oh, yeah. But I have to tell you, oh, were you? I have to tell you, it's left me a very firm believer in affirmative action. Because when I went to college, not this one, which was, by the way, was a 2% school for mm. Jews in public yeah. school. Uh, I went to college, I was with a lot of, pardon the expression, dull white Christians. Where did you go to college? Uh, Muhlenberg College. Which one? Very, very Muhlenberg College. Okay, I know. But after the first year, when I saw people who I didn't think was qualified, I realized that these are guys who got a good chance. And I've known them for 60 years now. And many people who would walk in and say, you know, I'm really glad they gave me a chance. And I think, yeah, they gave you a chance. I'm really happy they got a chance. And I apply that, actually, to other disadvantaged groups. Well, you're shaking your head. No, I'm not. I'm a, no, I think you... Let, let me talk about what I think to be the very deep and profound ambiguities with respect to this. Let me first distinguish uh, what happened in New York City from what happens in colleges. Many of you will know that Bill de Blasio decided he wanted to diversify uh, the Stuyvesant Bronx Science and the other elite high schools in New York City. And the Asian population in particular fought back with a ferocity uh, which could not be mentioned. And I think they were right. Why is that? Uh, because this is a monopoly situation. Uh, these are the only places you can go in town to get this free education. And to the extent that you start putting in explicit racial divisions on this thing, I think it's a serious mistake. Uh, but let me tell you about college, my college experience. Uh, maybe a little younger than you, I entered college in 1960. And essentially, I had applied to Harvard. And you know, I had pretty strong grades and pretty strong boards, but there were these two kids from Great Neck High who were terrific testers mm -hmm. and very distinguished guys. <laughs> and Harvard had a Jewish quote. And so they took those two fellows, and I didn't get in there. I didn't want to go to Princeton or to Yale. I just thought with my dining habits, I could not survive <laughs> either <laughs> institutions. And uh, as people who have seen me at lunch today will know that this is not a a misapprehension of my native talents and skills. <laughs> and so what happened is I applied to Columbia, and they took 25 people from my class in Great Neck High with a man named David Dudley, because the only thing he cared about were boys and grades. And so his class was 75% Jewish, 75% from New York. They weren't the same 75%. The class was so much stronger than the Harvard class of that same year, uh, it wasn't even worth a comparison in terms of ability. And he tried to do the same thing the next year and there was some resistance, and the year after that he was fired. Um, because they said, we just can't run a school uh, which has this kind of a skewed situation. This is the whole problem of balance, which everybody in every institution who's ever run them knows is serious. How many alumni kids do you take in? 
Don't want to take too many. Don't want to take few. How many large donors? Not too few, not too many. These are all marginal adjustments, and governments can never make things at the margin. So, you know, I didn't get into Harvard, and there's some people who didn't get into Columbia. But there have been a lot of studies, and what they all tend to show is the following. You get a kid who doesn't get into the Ivies, just misses, and he ends up going to one of the big state schools, Illinois, Penn State, Colorado, and so forth. And then you track them by simply looking at, let's say, boards and grades in the two schools and seeing which ones do better, and they do about the same. It turns out what happens is they're compensating advantages to being at Penn State over Penn, which is you're now at the very top of the class, and all of a sudden this faculty starts to push you in a way which you may get lost at another institution where instead of being in the top 2%, you're in the top third. And so I always tell people at the university level, you let this sorting take itself out, and it will be all to the better one way or another. And then what I always try to tell parents is what I told myself when I was rejected from Harvard, is the world has not ended under these circumstances. What really matters is the way in which you do it. A competitive economy has tremendous redundancy associated with its operation. And so if the Ivy League schools want to go over, what it's going to mean is the big engineering schools like Texas A&M and Illinois and so forth, uh, they will prosper relatively. In a large, diverse country, you don't try to run things from the center. Uh, the affirmative action issue, the question is not whether or not. I've been a dean. First thing I told all people when I was a dean is affirmative action is not on the table as a yes and no matter. It's only on the table as a marginal matter. One student too many, one student too little. Every year I look at the performance. Actually, I was dean for four, four months and nine days, but nobody's counting. Um, <laughs> and you make the marginal adjustments and so forth. Try to keep it stable. And the most important thing it takes as an administrator is to earn the goodwill and the trust of everybody in you, knowing that you're going to try to do this in good faith. It's an impossible thing. If you make it an all or nothing decision like it is in this lawsuit, disaster. If you make it an incremental decision the way Harvard wants to do it, it's much better. But it's much better if they do it more candidly and openly, mm -hmm. which they cannot do under the current legal situation. Yeah, uh, right up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. do, I, I don't know if we have microphones. Do we not have microphones? I guess okay. we go ahead. Yeah, fine. Very okay. Um, thanks for the talk. It was really interesting. But I have two quick questions. One is, um, what do you do with municipal governments? Do you think that they are market actors? Can the market sort out in a T-boat sorting style um, what to do with cities and towns? Right. So as long as people can move cities and towns, then we should allow municipal um, discrimination on the basis of race or, or not. And then my second question is, um, what about expressive uh, impacts that the government will have on the market? So if we repeal the Civil Rights Act yeah. of 1964, won't that send a message to people that racial discrimination is okay and they're, they're thereby distorted? The okay, let me answer the first question first. For those of you who are not familiar, there was an economist named Charles Thibault who wrote one famous paper in 1956 and then had a bad race to die at age 42. And what he said is that the way in which local governments work is they allow sorting to take place so that residents can kind of move to the communities they want to. And if you want to be in a community which has got tough zoning, you can move there. If you want to move into a community with high rises and lots of activity, you can move there. Um, there is certainly some truth to this, and it goes more generally in the literature under the name of whether or not the exit right is something which is sufficient to protect various individuals. Uh, the problem with the argument is that it's wrong at least three And the problem is, if I'm unencumbered by capital coming in from Mars, I can decide to go to Wallingford or to Meriden, Connecticut, one with tough zoning and one without. Meriden does worse because it's an old line school than Wallingford, so it tells you something. But suppose I'm a person who owns a capital asset in a particular area, and they decide to zone it down. At this particular point, I may be able to go, uh, but the zoning may take my lot, which for industrial development was worth $100,000, and reduce it to $10,000, and I can't cart that on the back with me. The question is, can I challenge the zoning? So the way in which your thesis works is only if it's confined with respect to robust property protection for a mobile asset, of which land and improvements turn out to be the main one. What makes it much more difficult today is since the famous case in 1926 Euclid against Ambler Realty, the ability of the state to zone land by end use has been pretty much unlimited, 
except in the most marginal cases. And this has been complicated in 1978 by a case called Penn Central um, against the um, city of New York, where you could wipe out somebody's building air rights by simply saying you're making enough money with your ground property. So if you have weak property rights, the exit rights won't work. So for your T-bow to work, you have to change the property rights system. And then if they want to confiscate your property, they have to pay you fair value. At that particular point, uh, the exit right is now credible because you can always sell the property to somebody else without the danger of being zoned down by what's going on. So I think uh, what you need to understand about this is that even federalism uh, requires strong property rights because exit rights are only insufficient protection. Not irrelevant and often extremely powerful. And indeed, you know they're important because any dictatorship will typically try to stop their use and application. Rich, can you move back oh. uh, behind the... Oh, oh, the camera, the camera, the camera. Mm -hmm. uh, the second question you ask is about expressive stuff. And, and I always regard that as a swamp into which I would rather not enter if I uh, cannot do it. Because everything turns out to be expressive. But the problem is, if you're doing implied expression, uh, the expressions come in multiple and inconsistent fashion. Uh, so if you decide that you are going to repeal uh, some of the Civil Rights Act, what does it mean? Does it mean you have now deserted all minority students because you refuse to give them government protection? Or does it mean that you believe that everybody in the society is now sufficiently protected by the ordinary civil rights or the ordinary common law rules uh, that what we've done is we've gotten rid of a transitional phrase that we no longer need? And so you can't control the meaning that's attached to these kinds of externalities. And you can't allow one group to say what the meaning is of a particular situation. So when I wrote my book on civil rights law, book which I hope some of you would want to read called Forbidden Ground, I ended it with a conclusion which I addressed with this is what I now call the soft externality problem. That is hard externalities of you know, nuisance smog, right? Antitrust violations of one kind or another. Soft externalities are expressive. And I said, E stands for externalities everywhere. And you have so many of them, and so many moving in so many different directions, that the one thing you do not want to do is to have the selective protection of some of these externality interests and ignoring the others. And it's that asymmetry which creates all sorts of problems. Now, there is the problem of government speech. Sometimes we have a loud mouth for a president. I won't give any particular names. Sometimes you have somebody who's a smooth and somewhat glib off, you know, Author, I won't give any names there, but there's a big difference. They have to say something to do their job, but they don't have a monopoly on speech. There's always people in Congress, everywhere else, who can start the talk. So that market becomes a bit more competitive, uh, notwithstanding the fact that there's somebody who's a giant-sized player. In it. So generally speaking, I think that you know when you're dealing with these forms of speech, the non-intervention rule is better because the intervention is of uncertain form, and the consequence of it is often going to be quite harmful. Yes, Professor Stern. A great lecture. So Thank I was wondering, why, why is your rationale for anti-discrimination laws, which as I understood it was uh, correcting for non-competitive markets, why isn't that broader than you identified at the end, which you said was about 20% of the economy? Yeah. Here's what I have in mind. Why couldn't somebody make the following argument and apply your rationale broadly? The argument would be that anytime there's an unconventional status or unconventional activity, which, the exi which by definition, the existing conventions, either physical structures, I'm thinking of bathrooms, it could be policies like dress codes. It, uh, it could be um, uh, expectations by employers like for, with head coverings for religious minority groups. Why couldn't that rationale be much broader than the 20% you identified? Well, because what happens is you're not going from 20% to 22%. You're going from 20% to 100%. And what happens is I think when you start having these kinds of special practices that take place within firms, whether it be just codes on the one hand or sort of lease renewal provisions on the other hand, uh, what you have to do is to understand that there are two sides to every one of these questions. Somebody is putting these things on. He's a profit maximizer in a competitive market. If what he announces is a dress code that's going to drive away strong applicants and antagonize customers, he's not going to do it. But if, on the other hand, that you have some of these headdresses which actually create serious logistical difficulties, uh, you're going to have to do it or you may have the other side. So they give you the famous sort of illustration about head covering is you're playing basketball. It's a private league. Do you allow yarmulkes that could be put on by a pin? And then what about these Rastafari head games, right? And it turns out you could play basketball with a yarmulke. You can't play it with one of these huge things. You'll kill somebody. So all of a sudden, you start drawing differences. And I think once you understand that the competitive pressures of the market 
will in fact influence the way individuals do it, and more importantly, the way trade associations would do it, because remember, you've got leagues in these particular cases. I think, in effect, that if you're trying to figure out uh, some systematic effects that really matter, uh, they are relatively trivial, even if I don't want to say they're zero, compared to the really vicious and ugly stuff where, you know, when I was a kid growing up and you decided to go down south as a white boy and stop at a black gas station, somebody would kill you. I mean, I regard that as rather more serious than somebody who sort of flutters their eyes at you with respect to indignation. And so I would never, ever want to use force against that. What would happen would be, I think, if you have soft difficulties, and some of them I think are clearly legitimate, you want soft responses with respect to the way they go. Um, what is a soft response is very tricky. Does a boycott count? Uh, there is the famous case of Claiborne Harbor, about 1975. And that, to me, was where the civil rights laws got off the rails. Because it was pretty clear a case of a collective refusal to deal back by the use of force, which should have been exercised against uh, the blacks who were protesting the white merchants. And what Justice Stevens did is essentially read the complaint in such an artificial fashion so as to trivialize the law. And that is, I think, the way in which I do it. And when you're dealing with soft externalities, if you apply them in a skewed fashion, you're going to create a cultural war, and I don't want to do that. Yes, uh -huh, there you go. Mm -hmm. With regards to things like Title VI, Title VII, the Civil Rights Act, you discuss them as being unfulfilled promises. Do you see them, what do you see as actually being the benefits, if any, the fulfillment of those pieces of legislation? And if they were to be repealed, would you see that cause any sort of effect as the actual causes benefits of things like the colorblindness? Uh, well, look, I mean, remember what I said. In 1964, the major thing to do was to dismantle all the public institutions of segregation. And these were anti-libertarian rules, to put it mildly. And for the first three or four years, you know, you did such things as saying that if you're running a public school system, you can't pay your black teachers half of what you pay your white teachers. And you cleaned up virtually all the civil services everywhere against these kinds of invidious distinctions. Uh, you got rid of formal segregation. What I said is Act 1 was essentially a triumph. It's that Act 1 misunderstood what the source of the difficulty was, which was concentrated force in the hands of the state and some of its, uh, shall we say, more unsavory citizen. <coughs> and what it then did is it attacked competitive markets in the next stage. And that's where the problem comes. You reduce productivity, you create various kinds of resentments. Uh, what happens is now anything that you want to do on by way of a racial difference, you have to justify to an eternal authority. There's going to be no consensus in the world as to what does or does not count as a situation. I can still remember my years with Justice Scalia at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, Nino was such a fierce opponent of uh, affirmative action in terms of the way it ran that I would say, and I would say it again now, I'd say it to him if he were here, I just can't let you run or any get anywhere near an admissions program, uh, because if you did so, you would so polarize the particular operation. We don't want speeches like that. We want to basically uh, diffuse the situation by having low-level individual cases. And what happens is you can't do that with an anti-discrimination law. Why is that? Because you take case number one, case two is the same as case number one. Can you distinguish between them? Well, if you're running an admissions program, what you want to do is if you take case one, you fill one hole, you want case two to be very different. You want to fill a different hole. If somebody says, well, you did A, you got to do B, then it's a choice of two is zero, and that's essentially something you don't want. So in order to keep the flexibility alive, you can't have people second guess every comparison, which is the way, of course, all the litigation goes. And then when you go start seeing what happens in Gruder and all these other cases, it turns out <coughs> you get reaction and overreaction. Ward Connolly, I fiercely oppose this. He wants to basically get rid of affirmative action programs inside universities. I want to decentralize them. And so you get rid of them, and then you use stupid proxies. Top 10% of any school in Texas, all right, in order to get the mix. I don't want to use bad proxies. I want to use um, correct kind of judgment. My view is you cannot run a modern society in which identity politics has a role to play, legitimate role to play, and pretend that it doesn't exist. It has to be recognized, and then you have to deal with it. And by the way, there, and as an administrator, having done this, I can tell you, one of the things that one of my deans, Gerhard Casper, told me, he said, the Richard in his Cambridge accent. He said, when I want to say yes to somebody, I can do it very quickly. When I want to say no, it takes a very long time. And one of the things that you discover in running an affirmative action program of any sort, you're always saying no to somebody about something 
it's labor intensive. And you just have to understand that going into the business. If you start to go in there and think that you can get some sort of a fixed rule and solve it, that's crazy. The Harvard people all know that in terms of running their admission. And my guess is if I could talk to them privately and guarantee that there would be no public use of their information, they sound a lot more credible than they do in their zoopy kinds of public statements. Uh, I wrote a piece in the Michigan Law Review in 2002, and the basic theme of the paper, quite simply, was Affirmative action is not a legal problem, it's a management problem. And if I get the right managers, I can handle it. I get the wrong managers, everything goes to hell. Anybody who's ever run a corporation knows why we spend so much time on figuring out who the CEO is. Because you get the wrong CEO, it just radiates down throughout the organization. You get the right one, you have a fighting chance. So what you have to do is to put good people in high places and hope they'll put good people in other places. And all the law can do is to stop some of the most egregious forms of behavior, which are not likely to happen in any particular case. So it's a very different view of the world. Um, if you've been involved in institutions, you understand how difficult they are to run, and you start to get a little bit more slack to a bunch of people whom you fundamentally disagree with. Akil? Um, thank you for being here, Professor. Um, Louder. Yeah. In uh, Gooder and Grads, Justice, uh, Justice Powell, I think, talks about, you know. Powell, Congress. he's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, this 2000. Just, just, just O'Connor. Oh, sorry, just O'Connor. Uh, someone starts talking about. Um, uh, was it Baki? I think. Well, Baki. Baki 78. That's Powell. Okay. That's Powell. Oh, yeah, I think that. that well, yeah, he didn't know what was going he on. He talks about diversity as sort of being an end in itself. Like the purpose of education is to, you know, of an educational institution is to bring about diversity. Um, but if we start thinking about this affirmative <coughs> action, um, less in terms of race and more in terms of it being used as a proxy for socioeconomic status, then if once you start thinking about it that way, is there a case to be made? Um, well, my answer is, the is there's always going to be the trade-off, the Appalachian kid and the inner city kid. But the thought that Justice Powell knows enough to figure out which kid you're going to choose from which class and why is a pipe dream. And it was clear he knew nothing whatsoever about admissions or when he made these statements, because when he starts talking about racial preferences and alumni preferences and athletic preferences all coming out of the same hat, um, it's just simply not true. Um, the kinds of the discounts, the students that you're recruiting, the way in which you integrate them, the way in which you train them, everything differs. And as everybody knows who's ever done any university administration, and I've done a hell of a lot of it over the years, uh, it turns out universities are extremely difficult to run because you can't run things on a mass basis. There are no assembly lines like there are in the Ford Motor Plant of 1937. Uh, so, um, as our friend Frank Zimmering, if you remember, Stan, used to say, um, everybody's a special case, right? And if you've got 1,100 special cases coming into Princeton, it's labor intensive. And so that's why I'm just so reluctant uh, to make these statements. It's not that I don't think that there's a grain of truth in them or they're not sensible, but if you do this and you're sitting there in a Supreme Court and then the next day you go on to a bankruptcy case, it's a very different world than sitting there as an administrator saying, well, now this guy has spoken and fled the coup. What am I supposed to do? It's just much harder to make an operation. Let me, let me follow up, Richie, on uh, Akil's uh, question. Um, so when you talk to people who uh, are either scholars or activists who support uh, the kinds of preferences that are involved in cases in, of, of admission like Gratz and Grutter. Uh, they'll very often say the following. Uh, look, we want these programs in order to benefit the students who get the places and to rectify past wrongs and to, to, to advance a, a view we have about justice. But the court told us, beginning with Bakke, going all the way up through the Michigan cases, we're not allowed to do that. But the court also signaled us that there's this justification, it's actually not our justification, but there's this justification that because these classifications trigger strict scrutiny, yeah. you know, re ge generates a requirement that, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, you have a compelling state interest, and that diversity constitutes a compelling state interest. So we've been forced by the court to put all our arguments in this artificial category and to essentially justify what we're doing by saying, of course it doesn't benefit. Of course the point is not to benefit the students who get the places. It's to benefit all these other people who otherwise are surrounded by dull Christians and need <laughs> the diversity to have a good education. Well, look, this is the same sort of silliness, just in another direction. 
I mean, if you were to ask somebody in the abstract, do you take into account past discrimination? Do you take into account diversity? Do you take into account a thousand of other things? The answer is yes, but the hard question is how much and with which cases and why. Mm -hmm. And the moment the Supreme Court announces that there's one rationale that works and everyone else that failed, everybody now has to skew their discourse, which is what makes us all liars when we start talking about this particular problem. So if the Supreme Court basically took the following view, don't treat affirmative action as a justified exception to the anti-discrimination law. Uh, treat it as simply a business choice made by an institution not bound by the uh, anti-discrimination law. You get very different results because in one case, you have to satisfy an external authority, which frankly knows nothing about what's going on. And in the other case, you're going to be subject to many margin market preferences. Look, I have no question uh, that the way in which an affirmative action program today would work would be very different if we didn't have to worry about the disparate impact studies coming on the other side. Uh, because what happens is, the way the politics works, is there's some people who are opposed to affirmative action, but they says, look, I can't run the risk of being hit by a disparate impact case, so I'm going to go along with you uh, more than I would otherwise do. Mm -hmm. yeah, that you true. get rid of the thing, then all of a sudden the internal discourse starts to change a bit. Now, I think the Ivy Leagues have gone over the top. Uh, because it turns out if you just look at any of the numbers for Princeton or Yale or NYU, and you see the skew by any measure you care to give, essentially hard left dominates moderate right by a number of 10 to 20 to 1. Mm. And this is absolutely deadly. So uh, I get a hearty audience of people who are willing to hear what I have to say. Uh, nobody's going to put me in the main hall and try to appeal to the vast bulk of Princeton undergraduates. And I think, in fact, that the balance that has taken place in universities is nearly fatal in terms of what's going to happen. And I do believe that major Ivy League institutions will pay a price mm -hmm. uh, because people will start to understand what's going on and slowly but surely more and more parents will start to say, I did not want to send my kids into a political hellhole. Uh, they could learn engineering at Texas A&M. Um, <laughs> and it's a lot cheaper and a lot better. So I mean, I don't regard Princeton or Yale or Harvard as free from these things. I think in the short run, uh, they're very small institutions, uh, so they're always going to be able to fill up their ranks with pretty much whom they want. Uh, but I think in terms of their national influence, they're going to be essentially slowly displaced by these other organizations, which essentially are a little bit balanced on this stuff and have a slightly different tone. I've um, often wondered if that was going to happen. I, I don't think I, it's going to I just don't think no, it's going to happen. I don't, I mean, parents want their kids to have that credential. Yeah, we they will pay any, they'll subject them to any <laughs> well, I don't. I mean, let me put it to this way. Uh, the parents that you see are the ones who are doing it. The parents you don't see aren't doing that. Um, and that's the great problem. I and mean, one of the things that you're always worried about when you're running a business is if you simply look at the target population in front of your noses, you miss the target populations that are moving uh, to some other place. And you're also missing the fact that even though you're doing it, uh, there's going to be a quality decline that's going to be reflected in what happens. This is going to influence the way things when they go on the outside. That's why uh, running an affirmative action program is life at the margin. It is not the life of categories, which you're trying to talk about. And none of the people who talk about this could survive five minutes of actually trying to run one of these programs. One of the hardest things that I think every lawyer has to be able to do in his or her own life is to understand you're creating legal rules for management decisions to take place. You're not the manager. No. And if you don't understand that, uh, then what you do is you become wildly overconfident in your judgment and massively interventionist in what you're prepared to do. And if you want to figure out where the dose of that is at its all-time high, unfortunately, the Supreme Court is not a bad place uh, <laughs> to start, uh, mainly because I think even on both sides of the line, there is a little bit of that we're the highest court, so therefore we know the most about how other things work. My view about a legal system is the first thing you're trying to figure out is how we reduce the burdens on collective decisions through the state, not trying to make them correctly because we know more than everybody else. It's a very different kind of mindset. And so on the affirmative action stuff, to the extent that you see interventions in cases where I think the processes work well, I think that the conservatives who are saying the only way to deal with affirmative action is to get rid of it are making a serious mistake. It's here to stay in some sense. Management is the issue, as I've said before. It is not exclusion. And I think Justice Roberts, who's never run anything in his life, right, uh, is not the person to make management decisions. He's the person who argued a bunch of appellate cases. It's a very different kind of profession.
I do not in them generally think that lawyers are suitable business executives, precisely because they think too much in terms of rights and duties, not enough in terms of management, and because they haven't had any systematic effect in running complex organizations. Now, I should tell you, I'm, I've done a lot of running in complex organizations at university level, and the first thing I had to learn to do is not to sound like a lawyer every time I talk. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I hate to uh, bring our uh, deliberations uh, to a close, but we're just about out of time. But I do have time to do one very uh, pleasant thing, and that is to welcome and to thank Doris Murphy, the widow of Walter Murphy, who's made the trip up again for the Murphy Lecture. Doris, we're so delighted to have you. Thank you, Doris. Been so proud. And the other thing I want to say to Richie is just how much Walter, whose earliest work was on uh, anti-discrimination law and uh, constitutional interpretation, uh, Brown versus Board, how much he would have enjoyed and been provoked by and riled up by uh, <laughs> Professor Epstein's uh, lecture. It's the sort of thing that, uh, that Walter uh, loved, and I uh, have the sense he's smiling down. Uh, uh, on us uh, uh, for this. And so, Richie, thank you for oh, my helping pleasure. us to honor Walter in this way and uh, for enlightening all of us. And thank you. Thank you all.